Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None accepted. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Cause Stone Cold said so. If you're gonna blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I am Jeff Howell. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the driver shooting extraordinaire, Matt Butler. How are you, sir? Doing pr- pretty well. How about yourself? Practicing safe social distancing. And mm-hmm. Lifetime Longhorn 2002 UTL American 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the CFL. When he was done with football, Got himself back to Austin, Texas in the 40 Acres where he earned his degree. Whenever that T-ring comes in, we will make sure he wears it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU. And when you get that All-American honor recognized by the NCAA, they make sure you get one of those black cards. Number 21 in your program, no more than your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. Doing great. How are you? Wonderful. And uh, we are practicing social distancing. I don't know how much longer we're going to be allowed to do this in this format. Big thanks to Travis, best damn videographer in the podcast game, for helping us out. Uh, while we don't have our normal studio. Uh, Before we jump into it, guys, and we do have some news notes and nuggets, we'll go back and look at some things in Tom Herman's teleconference last week, uh, and we'll get to the Denzel Okafor news and a couple other things going on. What did you guys think of the watch-along? Like, uh, did you have a chance to go back and listen to it, watch it, react from it? I had some people that told me that was a really cool idea. We hadn't done that before. We'll probably do another one of those again, but uh, did you guys like the... Kind of change, change, yeah. changing yeah, it up fun. a little bit. Definitely enjoyable, and it's something down the road worth doing again. And it was sort of like it coincided with like it was a national watch along almost for Texas USC on Thursday night where everybody was watching. So right now, you can definitely be open to any new ideas for the time being. For sure, we'll uh, we'll look. We're gonna probably be in off season mode for a while, so we've got time Gotta to play with. <laughs> play with some, some different That's stuff. That's the funnest time to do shows like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we, we jump into the football stuff, too, uh, you know, I think everybody – I avoid replays of the 2006 Rose Bowl, mm-hmm. like the plague. I just don't. I, it's on all the time. And I love that LHN kind of gave everyone the middle finger by saying, you know what, we're going to run this thing on a 24-hour loop just because we can. <laughs> I loved it. People can't get enough of it. I watched I've, it like three times. I avoid it, I avoid it like the plague because it's almost – Rod, it's almost like that song you love, that movie you love. You don't want it to ever get stale, so you don't want to just run it into the ground. Yeah. So I waited until ESPN re-aired it uh, last week. And, man, it's amazing that the game still holds up. And I took a few different things from the game, and one of the things kind of bleeds into the Denzel Okafor conversation. When you look at Texas at that time, the line of scrimmage talent, I'm not just talking about offensively. I'm talking about the yeah, defensive, defensive line, defense. too. Mm-hmm. It, you can make the argument it is the best collection of line of scrimmage talent on one team in school history. When you look at both sides of the ball, what those guys achieved at Texas and what they went on to do as far as guys who got drafted, guys who played in the league. And, you know, right, it, just, it was one of those deals where Texas has been trying. Mac Brown tried and never could get it back. They've been trying to find that formula, that championship line of scrimmage formula, and they haven't really been able to find it. And there's a, a number of reasons why that's been the case. It's been coaching turnover or missed evaluations in recruiting or just bad scheme fits or whatever. But they've been trying to get back to that point, and they haven't been able to. And when you look at, like, take that offensive line, right? Of your five starters in that game, four of them played in the NFL. I think we can all say had Will Allen stuck with football, he was an All-American that year, probably would have made it five for five of guys who at least got a good chance to sustain something in the league. And when you talk about talented depth, Rod, Tony Hills was a backup on that mm-hmm. team. And you know Mike Garcia was a guy that played a lot. William Winston was a guy that played a lot that year. 
But you still had guys, even though they weren't NFL guys, you still had guys that gave you quality depth. Flip it over to defense, <laughs> your entire starting defensive line was drafted. Tim Crowder, Brian Robinson, Frank Ocam, Rod Wright. <laughs> you look at the backup, Roy Miller and Brian Arakpo were backups. Derek Loki's a guy that made an active roster Chiefs. and played in the NFL as an undrafted free agent, was a backup. So you look at all that talent, and it's not that Texas hasn't had talented guys, Rod, because you can look at NFL draft numbers, they have. It's just that shows you, we talk about Vince Young, we talk about the different aspects of that team. That, to me, is the most underrated aspect of that national championship team is a line of scrimmage talent because you still haven't gotten it back to that point through three head coaches and all the coaching turnover and all the recruiting classes. You've never gotten it back to that point. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a large macro issue, though. I mean, then you're mm -hmm. talking about the state of Texas and recruiting and uh, the, sp the effect the spread offense has had on, you know, the culture of offense mm -hmm. in, the big, in, in the Big 12 and also in the state of Texas in terms of high school football recruiting. But I think ultimately you got to get back to the point where you're getting the best D-line prospects and the best O-line prospects in the state. Yeah. And I don't know if Texas does that consistently. They're getting back to that with Tom Herman. And that's where you got to get to. When Back in those days, I mean, there was no doubt that Texas was getting the best D-line and O-line prospects in the state. That's where you start. And then, even though I know the, the entire landscape of recruiting has changed dramatically, actually, and you can't just depend on one state – at least for the most part, for everybody. You can't depend on one state to keep you comprehensively whole in recruiting anymore, like Mac Brown did. Mm -hmm. He dominated the state of recruiting, uh, and it was, he, was like a, he was like a third world dictator. I mean, he took the top recruits, and he, he, it was trickle down economics keep them for from everybody Oklahoma. else. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to happen again because there's kind of a, you know, the iron throne of, of, of Texas, who's the best, best, best football program in the state. Mm -hmm. That changes from year to year now. That's not just Texas like it was for a decade when Mac was yeah. reigning. That's no. It's sometimes it's te Texas A&M, and sometimes it's Baylor, and sometimes it's TCU, and sometimes oh, and U of H down there had oh, sometimes mm -hmm. Texas is back. You know, you never know. So nobody can consistently gain a stranglehold on recruiting, and they never will. And that is the conundrum. How do you get the best D line, O line in the state when A and M now has that SEC intrigue and LSU is in H town? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Making sure that they try to get the best, and then you got Oklahoma, and then you got Oklahoma State to deal with. So for Tom Herman, you know that is going to be. And I agree with you. I think unless you get back there, you know you're not going to be able to win in that college football playoff scenario. You can win in the Big 12 scenario. You can do that. Yeah. But to w even Oklahoma's having trouble with that. And Oklahoma is a far better football program than, than Texas. Sorry mm -hmm. to say that, but they are. Yeah. And they're having trouble once they get to the college football playoff stage of being able to compete at the, on the lines of scrimmage because they can't consistently get those big dogs like Ohio State's doing. The Bosa's and now Chase Young. Yeah, LSU exposed up. them. LSU, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? And LSU, LSU too. LSU's had a better uh, run of defensive and offensive linemen and of course we know about Bama and we know about Clemson so for Texas yeah I mean that's going to be I don't, I don't know how you do it they got to have a clear plan there's more than one way to skin a cat but right now I think they're off to a good start because for the first time in a long time they're getting those for those top four star five star defensive linemen in the state mm -hmm. and the main part about it when you look overall like at the evolution of the conference and where Texas fits now it's basically how you talked about getting that depth. You looked at the bus rate of those classes that were the foundation for that 05 class. You didn't, first you have to be very efficient. Even back then you did. And that was when it was just Texas versus Oklahoma and you feel good. You didn't even have the big 12 rise of the rest of the conference or say the now Aggies in the entire SEC yeah. to come poach your linemen. So the situation, the context around the whole state, it isn't a one man battle against them, but then you still have to hit on that same rate you hit back then when you had a much wider, vast group to choose from, when you had these players that were elite yeah. and maybe choosing one or two. Now it's even harder to make that bust rate stay that low when you have it being pilfered out to, say, the SEC and to be able to still go with OU and then within the Big 12, just the competitiveness. So it just makes it so much tougher to be able to look at it now and be like, we have to hit that at that same rate with more competition. So that's where the coaches, if you identify what you want and can go out and develop it, it still can happen. But if we're looking at the chances of it happening, it's a lot more something like your windows narrowed strictly because of the competition around you. And 
you still have to hit at that high rate just to barely be at that level to contend with those elite of the elite so for a championship year in, year out. But getting a Vernon Broughton, getting an Alfred Collins, First that, time, that's the start. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you've got to start doing what Gary Patterson's doing. You know what I mean? To turn a, a Ross Blacklock into yeah. what now some people are projecting to be a first-round pick yeah. in Tom McShane. You got to, you, those are your Brian know, Robesons or those guys yeah, that turned into exactly those guys. Came from. He was Ross Blacklock material. was a pretty highly recruited guy, but to, to your point, we look the bust rates along the line of scrimmage yeah. really in the last 10 years have been astounding especially gosh you look at like the, we'll talk about Denzel Loca for a minute but that got me thinking about the 2016 offensive line class and the defensive line class in that class right like you look at the defensive linemen Texas signed in 2016 Gerald Wilbon uh, grad, grad transfer yep. DeAndre Christmas grad transfer and neither one of those guys I don't think you describe you would describe them as impact players while they were at Texas Jordan Elliott transfer Jordan Elliott. Chris Daniels transfer Andrew Fitzgerald, medical retirement, like Marcel Southall, transfer. Like, other than Malcolm Roach, all that defensive line talent you brought in, that Charlie Strong brought in that one class, other than Malcolm Roach, you got nothing out of it. Do you know Charlie mm-hmm. can know how to recruit defensive talent? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and he didn't have what much thing we do there on the D-line. Well, yeah. that goes back to something Matt and I tracked when we started tracking bust rates. Like, when you look at those transition classes, that's where a lot of your, and not just the transition class itself, but the couple classes around it, all it takes is one head coaching change to just take a recruiting class and make it crap. Like, that's what makes what mm-hmm. Mac did so outstanding. Like, I was Rock, about to say that. That 2000 game we just watched, how good that was, but it was a good way of marrying a class and then being able to ride that hired momentum and that sort of initial wave from the new hire. Mac rode that so well and was able yeah. to establish that by 2 he's getting the foundation of the yeah. Blaylocks and those guys that fast. And, did it, and that was basically – you had Makovic not having to have an OU to compete against to get, say, the Casey's and the Leonard's and the Mike Williams and those type of guys. So it was a lot easier to you recruit. You were competing against a early. Basically, that was exactly. It. And then it became just OU. And then when you have that get, turn into what it turned into post-05 and the spread evolution, that just makes it so much tougher. Yeah. It's just hard because, you know, as you guys just pointed out, Texas had one recruiting Essentially, they had one recruiting peer, and yeah. it was a and in the state. And I'm, I, I'm not, I know Longhorn fans are going to say, what do you mean they are? Back Reckon in the day when I was in. being recruited, trust me, A&M in Texas, they were recruiting the same level. A&M that, was the only, that was the only program Texas got into recruiting battles with was A&M in the state. They didn't get into recruiting battles with freaking Baylor mm. and freaking TCU <laughs> no. and freaking U of H. But now, every now and then, they'd be like, oh, no, uh, Baylor uh, and TCU also want him. He's... he's He's mulling over Texas and TCU. You're like, really, what? Like, that didn't happen back in the day. But now yeah. that is the case because there is no clear-cut uh, best program in the state. It varies like Andrew from Billings year to year. was that guy. So, yeah, so now getting back to your point, it's just it's really hard to keep up the same hit percentage yeah. when you have lowered the talent pool, essentially, or you have to slice it up yeah. into a lot of different pies. Big time. You know, I went back and looked at this, Rod. And, my, Rod, you can see, you know, I've got my clinic notes pad. i got my – football pad and I got my my recruiting research pad and this page actually fell off of those first this is all the bus rate and hit rate numbers for Mm. every class from 98 through 14 are the ones that are completely done and I didn't so I didn't track 96 or 97 I didn't track the whole big 12 era but (laughs) I think I'm going to do it and just call it the big 12 era but for the and I'll have my articles on horse at horns 24 7 looking at this uh from 98 on but I'll I'll get them down pat for the entire Big 12 era. But I went back and looked at 96 when Mac took the job, that 96 recruiting class. Right, I counted 11 of 23 signees that he got something out of. But listen to some of the names of, of those 11. Mm-hmm. Brandon Healy, Jamel Thompson, J.J. Kelly, Matt Anderson, Corey Quiet, Roger Racer, Casey Hampton, Cedric Woodard, Aaron Humphrey, Donald McCown, and Chris Stockton. I remember those names. 97, 10 of 21 signees that John McAvick had, Mac, Mac Brown got something out of. Who were among the 10? Major Applewhite, Maurice Gordon, D.D. D. Lewis, Hodges Mitchell, Mike Jones, Leonard Davis, Sean Rogers, Kwame Caville, Greg yeah. Brown, Quentin Jammer. That's not like spares. No. It's all Americans. It's first-round yeah. draft picks. It's Ooh, all Big guys. 12 guys. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And by comparison, you look at, like, let's look at when Charlie Strong took the job. The 2012 class, you had a, 20, you had a 25% bus rate in yeah. that class. You're creeping up to 30. But your NFL hit rate, you're barely at 18%. For an NFL hit rate, 2013, as we've described it, yeah, the terrible. worst recruiting class in Mac Brown's tenure. Your bust percentage in that class, 46.7%. Your NFL hit rate was 20%. And of those NFL guys, 
that's only one of those guys was drafted, and that was Jeff Swain. Did they surpass the 2009 class? Yes, in terms of bus rate, yep. <laughs> and that's the cliff, because if you that's look crazy. back before, what was the older foundation before that? It was, I guess, 11 when it was Quandre and Shipley and those type that of guys. That 11th class only had a 4.5% bus rate. Yeah, so Both that was the foundation of the old heads that were just left over. Yeah, that's but when then, Mac was rebuilding, though. But that was when, the beginning but, of his and rebuild. And then Charlie gets the last, his first year gets the end of and then, that rebuild. And yeah. then he's left with the cliff. That was the 12 yeah. and 13 year. And it's yeah. sort of the same idea that either Mac seized it, there was no cliff back in that 99, 2000 class. It was able to vault. But if you don't have something behind it, it's like, well, you're going to be left with nothing. Luckily, Mac was left with Ricky in 98 to have that carry over and have well, a few guys. He was left with more than Ricky. He was left with Ricky and Casey Hampton. Yes. And Kwame Cavill and Sean Ryder. Dude, Magnavik left him a ton. Yes. That's what you would find and about that was those transitions drop, when you have a quick uh, amount of success early, even with, you know, Bob Stoops at Oklahoma or Urban Meyer at Florida. You go look, even Pete Carroll at USC at a blue blood, usually when they have that quick run, you'll go back and look like, damn, they left a, lo a lot of good talent. They maximized it, but they left them a lot of good talent. Going back to, it's very hard to be bereft of talent at a blue blood. Like, There's yeah. tons of talent there. Gosh, just ain't maximized. To your point, when Stoops took the OU job, I mean, he got there and realized, you know what? John Blake didn't do a whole lot right. Dude could recruit. Come on, yeah. Mike There's Leach. talent there. Tons of it. Yeah. yeah. And then once, hit Bob Stoops, all those guys that being first, second, third round draft picks, it was like, oh, they're all Blake guys. Yeah. Nobody gave Blake any, any credit at all. Hell no. And then you end up having Mike Leach come in and be like, I find a way to use these guys. Yeah. And you need to invent a mind with new pieces and a fresh look. And that's what's fun about seeing some Getting of these Josh classes. Josh Heifel at a JUCO didn't hurt either. Well, no. and when you get Smart a new move. coach to come in with a different perspective with the same players, how different that dynamic can change in just one offseason if it is that right fit. And that's what Texas fans, not to say Yersich could be that guy, but just – one change with the same talent can yield much different results, all dependent upon the situation. But to, to with Rod, we, we talk about we talk about this a lot uh, in the off season. It seems like it's been like the overriding theme since we started this damn show, damn near a decade ago. <laughs> is the the player development, talent development, or the lack thereof? We decided, Matt and I decided, and I've tweaked the formula, and I had to get Matt's blessing to tweak it because, you know, I didn't want to, like, Any take fine Matt's tuning. formula and call it mine. <laughs> no, more information. Copyright but, infringement. See, <laughs> I, I'm an information guy. More info, the better. We if decided, you want to add something, add We it. decided that, basically, if your NFL hit rate is 30% or better, you did a great job developing high-end talent in that class. Yeah. The 2008 class had a 33.3% NFL hit rate. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Manny Acho, yeah. Aaron Williams. Uh, who else was in that OA class? Keiston Randall was in that class. Yeah. yeah, you count Blake Gideon, who was an active, who was a, a practice squad guy for over a year, as part of our criteria. You know, the next time you had a recruiting class at Texas that had over a thirty percent NFL hit rate, you didn't. Maybe you didn't have one until twenty fifteen. You went from two thousand eight yeah, yeah. to twenty fifteen, where yeah. you didn't have a thirty percent hit rate of NFL. And what was guys. the twenty fifteen one? 33.3%, but that's, think about think about Tom Herman's first two years, mm -hmm. though. That's Malik Jefferson, Deshaun Elliott, Charles Amenahu, Patrick Vahe, you know, Patrick Vahe doesn't count toward that. Uh, P.J. Lott counts toward that yep. NFL hit rate. Was Dixon in there? Yes, long ball Dixon <laughs> counts toward that. <laughs> yeah. But, I love that we had a punter leave early. But to the point we're talking about, we talk about tr bust rates, how does Tom Herman get in a situation last year where your depth isn't great and you're having to play a lot of young guys? Have a 2016 recruiting class where your bust rate's through the roof because you have all those de all that defensive line attrition, all that offensive line attrition. Yeah, that's a situation when you see that 16 class like that. Now it's a little bit different on the timetable, but those can be similar to your 12, 13 that can become a cliff or like say your 09 class, like one class can pull you down and that's why the big freshman group that came in with Herman were so key that he could be the one that can be that leaping off point sort of like you were in that 99 class going forward because it can lay a foundation. But the bus rate's the main thing. Just prevent that from happening. And if you're a school like Texas, like you said, you got talent there, you're going to be able to be at least serviceable. And then if you have the right coaches or the right players, then you can be really good. I think, and, and you know, I always say that, you know, you, you need talented football players to play defense. And I'm not saying you don't need talented football players to play offense, but schematically and and from a tactical standpoint, you 
you can a scheme can give you an advantage on offense. We've seen that with the air raid at Texas Tech mm -hmm. and Washington State. You know, you don't have to have the talent that Texas has, but that scheme can give you an advantage over Texas. Hill Lincoln Rowley at Oklahoma. Uh, he combines that with the uh, with the premier talent. If if you look at the uh, just kind of the the trends of the defensive side of the ball where you need just talent. Like, you got to get talent. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that you can be a premier defense. Their scheme is not going to give you that much of an advantage defensively. No. Not these days. You can see where Texas, those cliffs you talk about, mm -hmm. you can see them clearly and distinctly yes. on the defensive side of the ball. That's why first years for – you know, Todd Orlando, for Manny Diaz, for Vance Bedford. With the old all, heads. Yeah, you know what I mean? Veterans. All of them really good years because they're, they're inheriting it. Then they get that cliff from that, that I don't know, that decayed or decrepit recruiting class, whatever, mm -hmm. it's, which one it is, that ends up having a huge bus rate or whatever. And then you can see that cliff because they don't have the guys to back up. Mm -hmm. those veterans yep. who inherit it, they inherit it. Then they're supposed to have somebody to, to hand it off to, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have anybody to hand it off to. Or those guys are so young that they're inexperienced and they have such growing pains yep. until they become experienced football players. And that's why in the first year for all of those guys, they have the same arc. All of those guys are, oh, man, Tarlando, we got to send him to an extension. Man, Ben Bedford's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, man, he is going to be next head coach at Texas. He's so good. And then literally within the third year, we're like, this is the dumbest football coach who's ever coached at Texas. We have to fire him immediately. How the hell did this guy get this job? He should be sacking groceries. You know what I mean? And Nothing we can see this happen. But you know what I mean? It's like, and it's like, whoa, guys, something's going on here. We can't be, we can't make that same leap every year in a three-year span. But it's, it's, it's the cliff you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Offensively, it's harder to see and it's harder to track like well, that. You can cover it up. you can get a scheme that literally can help you out. And Texas hired new offensive coordinators, right? And had brought in tons of new schemes. That's part of the offensive identity crisis. But on defense, you can clearly see mm -hmm. it. You can clear that arc every time. And that's what you're hoping that, you know, Chris Ash can avoid. And that's when you're talking about, you know, a veteran group. It has players that play smart. It isn't necessarily football IQ. You can acquire it in many ways or accumulate it over your time. It's really hard to be a freshman or a young player to plug in. And now if you are, you're going to be really good and you can last for a while. But you're more vulnerable in those situations. So this is just why you like your point about defense and how different it is from offense. Offense, you can either get the scheme in there. You have a few highly skilled guys, but you can sort of get away with a missed assignment here or there if it doesn't affect the integrity of the play. But the offense, the way it attacks a defense, they're looking for a vulnerability. Yeah. If you have a weakness, you can maximize yep. and exploit that weakness. And then if you understand, well, this guy on tape doesn't seem to be getting these schemes, you can easily find ways to confuse them. And that's where you'll hear like certain, like you always talk about Belichick and Jimmy Johnson and how you are never going to hire a dumb guy because yeah. he always knows that at least it's going to implement what we need. And then like you were saying, if you're on defense, you're out there because your skill set is at a higher level than, say, you know, other situations. You're going to get those 11 out there just to be able to play. So then it's really about marrying those two together. And if you don't have one or the other, you're going to have that crater that falls off that then in the modern day even gets attacked more so by great offensive minds than, say, it would have been 15 or 20 years ago. But to your point, Rod, I just calculated the bus rate for the 2016 class. It is, it is percentage points away from being the worst in – the, the Mac Brown era on 42.4% uh, or 46.4 uh, 2013 was 46.7. But to your and point, that's supposed to be like the experienced part of your roster, the, right? And on, especially on defense. Yeah. That, that group for Todd Orlando, that should have been those defensive linemen uh, and linebackers. Eric Fowler was part of that group mm -hmm. that should have been either third, fourth year juniors or true seniors this year. Oh, no. And so are they going to exactly. be able to get I, should have a lot of Malcolm Roaches out there and you didn't. You yeah. should have more guys that, you know, be veteran guys who had been there, done that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't I didn't necessarily become a superstar, but hey, I'm dependable. You know what I mean? And I'm a veteran. I have a consistent baseline. Mm -hmm. You could you, you know what I mean, you could give me an a, an assignment and I I I can execute it yes. for you. You know what I mean? And, and be dependable in that. And yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna be overcome by the moment or the game because I played in Texas OU and I played in the bowl game. Mm -hmm. You you were missing that, and I think you can go back and look at all those defensive coordinators, and they probably were a class that Heavily affected their third year. Oh yeah, you can. You can it see decimated. It. I mean, for Manny Diaz, it was 
really that 2009 and 2010 group, mm -hmm. the 09 class bus yeah. rate about 43%. Oh, the 2010 class bus rate was almost 38. Killed it. So that's Manny's downfall. Yeah. And then for Vance Bedford and Charlie Strong, like we talked about, it's that 2013 class that by Charlie's second year, it, other than really your defensive guys, other than Nashawn Hughes and Antoine Davis, guys that weren't playing a ton, you, you had nothing. Yeah, and it was a purge was a part of that. Not that sure. you had yeah. guys, not that you had guys that uh, that like, weren't good. No, yeah. there you had no bodies. They weren't around. Yeah, yeah. And, and the is. and the you know the, the 2012 class was was kind of the same thing. I mean, yeah, you know you had Malcolm Brown, but when he leaves and then Ridgeway's banged up, it just it exacerbates the fact that oh that guy that the previous staff was counting on, well maybe he's a depth guy for us. Now for the next step, he's got to be a frontline guy. Yeah. And he's not ready to be a frontline guy or in a position to be a frontline guy. So we say all that to say this. When you look at the, the numbers that Tom Herman's putting together for the 2018 classes and where the 2019 class got some attrition, but at least it's not falling off a cliff, that's going to really tell the story of how this thing goes. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at the 2016 class, again, that's got over a freaking 45% bust rate, Denzel Okafor is in that class. And he wouldn't have gone towards the bus rate because he did contribute, but puts his name in the portal, takes his name out of the portal. Hey, Tom Herman's two for two guys on guys back. going into the portal and being able to pull him back like out. Three for three. And what he did with Juwan Mitchell and then Denzel Okafor. Casey Thompson? Well, yeah, but it, I'm talking about just in this offseason. Oh, uh, okay, this yeah. offseason. Okay. Like it's a good one overall. for fans to know, though, that like you don't have to give up on a guy if he goes in we there. This transfer portal thing is good for the kids to just know what options are out there. Casey I would Thompson, like the overall numbers. To Casey see. Thompson's rod, that was more like uh, quarterback transfer roulette, almost like who's going to blink <laughs> first. Because like, you knew with Cameron Rising, Rising and Casey Thompson, like, one of those guys was leaving. Yeah. It's just like, are, are you leaving first or am I? Well, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go first. Are you? <laughs> I ain't gonna give it up if Casey you're Thompson's leaving. Thompson's probably wishing he had left now. Truth be told. Probably, I yeah, don't. When it when it comes down to it, in the end, he's gonna be yeah. like, I probably should have just left. Because yeah, I mean, <laughs> but the then selfishly looking, for Texas yeah, fans, the way, you're like, the way hey, it's looking right numbers. now, there are more people hoping Hudson Card makes the leap than hoping Casey Thompson becomes the guy. And I think that's Tom Herman them too. And I think once it happens. And then you got what Jaquindon uh, back there too. I, I think ultimately he's gonna wish like, man, I should have just freaking transferred. Because and he might end up transferring anyway. Because if you're Casey Thompson, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go play to JUCO for a year? Because at this point for him, he's got to get film out there. No, if he were to transfer, like it's, I don't think it would just be a case where okay, you've been Sam Ellinger's backup for two years. Uh, yeah, we'll take you and throw you into the mix. And that's not to say there's not a P5 program out there if they were desperate enough wouldn't do that. But I think at that position, Rod, I, you you got to have an idea of what you're getting. Like if you if yeah. he were to transfer, I think it would just it would probably be to a JC where he could at least get some snaps and put That's something on true, tape. True, but most of the time it's just coaches who had recruited him coming out of high school and and, and, yeah. and loved him. You know what I mean? And and, and, and scouts fall in love with guys. There's go, a chance really the like upside guy. of a guy. Yeah, and you can go to a smaller school. I mean, you can go to Texas State. You tell me you can't go to Texas State? Oh, for sure. No, he could, but <laughs> yeah. or, or, I mean, he probably. Could. But it, it would depend. Then then the conversation that we're having. A different conversation has become if you're Casey Thompson what are your aspirations are your aspirations to transfer to a p5 program because if it's to a p5 program yeah at that point unless unless it's a situation like and we're not saying Casey Thompson a transfer no, 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 we're going completely hypothetical here yeah. uh if like NC State needed a quarterback I think Tim Beck would have seen enough of Casey Thompson be like yeah why don't you come in here because you're gonna have yeah, a pretty good It'll be for. somebody who liked him anyway or already knew yeah. about him. Well, and then like his situation yeah. here, anybody that is gonna have a chance to be the backup to Sam Ellinger, that's a good spot because it all it takes is a play or two and you can be the starting QB at Texas. That's very like, true. That's, I mean, where Major Apple was birthed that way and certain other teams and, and schools, you know that you're that snap away and that's a carrot to dangle in front of a head too. It is, it is, but I'm just saying, I know your situation wants another quarterback. All right, that's been reported, and you guys have talked about that. He wants another quarterback. They got Hudson Card out there. You got Jaquindon out there. I'm, I'm just saying, from the way it's looking, if you're mm -hmm. in case, he's probably saying, man, I wish I'd have just you got, transferred. You got Jalen Milrow in that 2021 class, and they were looking to add a second in that class. That's what I'm saying. I don't like, think they're going to be able to. That's what I'm saying. Uh, like, because yeah, like, it's, you know, it's the way it's like, you got a new regime, a new coordinator, and Casey Thompson is, you know, he wasn't recruited by that coordinator. So he may like Casey Thompson's skill set, but he's no he's not Sam Ellinger. So hey, Sam Ellinger, you have that that's your guy, of course. And Sam Ellinger's a high level quarterback. We, so yeah. I'm saying usually guys like that get lost in the shuffle when there's a there's a, there's an offensive culture change. This is an interesting mm -hmm. interesting conversation to have because 
for two reasons. One, when you look at the guys that Mike Yurcich offered to try to put in the class with Jalen Milrow, Sawyer Robertson out of at Love Coronado, who's going to play for Mike Leach at Mississippi State, mm-hmm. and Garrett Nussmeyer, Doug Nussmeyer's son out of Flower Mount Marcus, who sounds like he's headed to LSU. Those guys are more of what you would think about. The, I hate the labels now because I don't think they really apply anymore. But what you would think about more prototypical kind of pro style type guys yeah. with functional athleticism, unlike a Jaquinta Jackson or Jalen Milrow, where you think of more of kind of like you've got a true, and how I would define a dual threat skill set is, are you athletic enough in the run game to where a, a coach, an offensive coordinator at the college level can design a run game around your skill set? Like that's why Sam Ellinger is a dual threat quarterback. You can design a run game around Sam Ellinger's skill set. Garrett Nussmeyer and Sawyer Robertson aren't that guy. And I think, too, I think it's probably a good thing they're not taking one because this is a different discussion. We don't talk much recruiting on the show. But, Rod, have you heard about Quinn Ewers at South Lake Carroll? No. Okay. Go class of 2022, might end up being a top overall prospect in the country. Hmm. Like, our national guys are talking like Trevor Lawrence-type skill set hmm. with this kid. Hmm. So that's kind of from Mike Yersitz. That's, that's kind of the... The, the, the carrot being dangled down at the end of the road, like, okay, you might miss on these guys, but, man, if you get Quinn Ewers, that could resolve your quarterback situation for three or four years. How do you spell his long. name for fans that don't know him? Uh, Ewers? You had to put me on the spot. Sorry. Yeah, we don't need to, but yeah. I just didn't even know what to Google. No, that's a long way down. No, <laughs> e- no that's a long e- way down the line. E-W-E-R-S. Yeah, you got to be looking at those kind yeah. of guys. Yeah. Uh, especially as early as the quarterback, as quarterback recruiting is. You know. Yeah, well, you got to because, you know, you, you – your focus every year is to just bring in as many quality quarterbacks as you can. I love that Tom Herman, you know, basically every other year brings in two. I think that's smart. It's just, I mean, these days they're going to leave. People are like, well, you're making them leave because you're bringing in more quarterbacks. It's like, dude, you cannot control they're that. They're going to leave anyway. You cannot control that. The truth mm-hmm. is 50% of the of the blue chip quarterbacks you bring into your program transfer. That is, that, those are actually 247 sports numbers. <laughs> and you don't know about injury. That's another thing that's out of the equation. That's up to the football gods. And then you don't know if, if guys is going to suck and not be able to transition to the next level. Not their fault. It's hard. It's a hard game to play and a hard position to play. Then you got guys that end up changing positions. Rojo. All right. We need you for something else. Play this. You know what I mean? Right now, there's like a 20% hit rate on quarterbacks. If You know what I mean? If you know what the hell you're doing. So, yeah, bring in as many as you can. The ones that transfer, ultimately, you can't control that because only one guy can play. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I like what they're doing at quarterback. I think bringing as many as you can. Exactly. If a quarterback's scared of competition as you bring them in, then, you know, he wasn't the guy. Well, and we've been long. yelling for a decade, you know, like yeah. basically the total inverse is where Texas was at, and there were no quarterbacks. And it's nice to get to a point where you're seeing multiple quarterbacks in classes being stacked up, so then you have a handful of options instead yeah. of being like, ah, this is the only one on the roster that can play. They're, they're admitting now they're going to transfer. They, that's why you recruit two quarterbacks yeah, in the same yeah. class. Now you know they're going to transfer. I mean, it's just, you know, And Rod, I like that they're honest on the front end. Yeah. At the pro level, you mentioned Bill Belichick. I'll throw another one in there. Mike Holmgren was really good about this. Guys don't, I don't think, figure out the quarterback position. The only thing you figure out is, you know what, I'm just going to bring in as many as I can and – a law of averages says, I'm going to hit on one of these The guys. smart organizations always do that. I mean, Jimmy Johnson, when he rebuilt the Cowboys, you know, he drafts Trey Aikman uh, number one overall, but then in a supplemental draft, literally the same year, they end up drafting Steve Walsh because he, he's like, no, I, I know this guy because they're not sure about Trey Aikman because mm-hmm. they, no, they're not sure about any of them. Yeah. Nobody knows about any of these guys. You don't know what you don't know once you realize how, how dumb you are about quarterback unless you're Bill Walsh or Andy Reid or – Sean Payton, yeah. Macau, Shanahan. Uh, you know, there's like eight of these guys on the planet that Cliff Kingsbury they know what the hell they're doing with a quarterback. Unless you got one of those guys or you are one of those guys, then admit you're ignorant about it. You don't know what the hell you're doing. And that's why Bill Belichick drafted 11 quarterbacks since Tom Brady. He's been looking for the next Tom Brady since he drafted Tom Brady. Okay. That's why he's going to succeed. He's going to succeed because he's going to keep on drafting quarterbacks until yeah. he finds the right one. And everybody else is going to keep going, like, no, no, I know I'm drafting this guy every three years, and we're going to see if he's the guy. No, 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 just keep drafting him. And then some Blaine Boyer for a million dollars. You Dude. know, like he's going to get so much production of it. I, I draft one. You ain't got to draft him high. I draft one every year. And the Cowboys, of course, have drafted the second fewest quarterbacks <laughs> in the NFL since 1999. Only the Colts have drafted fewer, but they've had Andrew Luck and freaking Peyton Manning. Yes. So it's understandable. But And, and I think New Orleans is tied with them. Yeah, because uh, of for Breeze. The fewest, for a they've had Drew Breeze. And it's like the Dallas freaking Cowboys. Or they're the dumbest 
They have the dumbest luck when it comes to quarterback of any organization I've ever seen. The football gods want them to have a quarterback really bad because they <laughs> should be in quarterback hell. Yeah, just keep on replacing them. But when you talk about that, trust, it's the same thing the NBA did with trust in the process. The idea of when Hinky did in Philly is like, man, we don't know at the top. Even if you're at the top of the NBA draft, it's a crapshoot from exactly. year to year on who it is. So it's about accumulating the amount of picks. So then if you have, say, two or three top picks every year or two or three first rounders and back to back years. One of those guys hits? That's can be a foundation of your entire team and that's what they did and they Amen. got rid of a couple that didn't work and that's where the smart teams admit that they don't know everything and then are open to new ideas that then can allow you to sort of fall into situations that are advantageous and then if it sucks you can quickly reboot it again, exactly. and that's why it's all planned that way. And then college is even more convenient because you get more to go hand pick than you do necessarily via last year's results in the draft class, the way the pro system set up. So with the college system, if you can go do that and then understand and basically recruit knowing the transfer aspect is available, not only that they can take away from you, but you can supplement your roster on a year-to-year -year basis and fill those holes sort of the way you would hear Mac talk about plugging a ship here or there. Well, nowadays with the grad transfers and the transfer portals, you, have to, you can be basically take more risks in recruiting to hit to try to get the right guys to fit, knowing that you have more opportunities to replace them quicker than you ever have before. I, I think, you know, I don't want to get too deeper into this, but I think it also helps, Rod, when you can recruit and you're not recruiting from a position of desperation. Yeah. Where you might reach on guys mm -hmm. or take unnecessary risks. Like you go back to that 2013 recruiting class that we talk about, that infamous class that still, even though the 2016 class is going to go down with a really high bus rate, it's not going to be quite as high as 2013. But, you know, Mac didn't want to take, uh, in, a, in another lifetime, there's no way Mac Brown would have ever touched a guy like Desmond Harrison. But yeah. needed to fill a yeah, hole. True. But he was desperate. They they needed they needed guys, and, and there were guys, you know, Got guys. Played the league though. Guys, yeah. It, <laughs> Harrison was a good. I mean, Mac wasn't rolling. No, he wasn't rolling. Playing the league for a few. Years. I mean, yeah. he got, we need those type of guys. <laughs> it was better than what you had on campus. I remember, like, I remember that, I'll never forget that one spring. Like he was out with a leg injury, and you found out, oh, like he got like shot. Had like a bullet graze his leg or something. <laughs> That's not a leg I'm, injury, right? That's a leg injury. That's a yeah. <laughs> and Plexico. <laughs> not like Dennis Weathersby, who got shot and still got drafted ahead of Rod back in two thousand. I forgot about that. Back or something. Yeah. I'm sad. I still man, sad the, the Cincinnati Bengals were the healthy Rod Baber sitting on the board said, nah, let's take the guy that got shot. He might have a collapsed lung or something, but yeah, like it's funny how like much better than Babers. How much it's different solid, that's for sure. the, the information age has changed the way that like you know everything about these people and these stories. Like it back like before like two thousand things like that happened to like major leaguers or NBA players all, all the time. And they had no oh damn they didn't report that. All right, I'm good to go tomorrow. It's pretty funny. And then you look at like the way that everything's changed with the information age. I just saw the NFL talking about their draft right now, and like you've seen these different hate groups or whatever infiltrate these Zoom meetings or whatever these meetings are, depending upon a college campus or whatever. They're worried so much now, not only of outside forces hacking the NFL draft, yeah, but are. other teams hacking into other teams' Zoom drafts and like just where we're at in this information era so quickly and yeah. how much everybody can know everything about everybody, even unbeknownst to you knowing that they know it. No, if you hire a hacker, I mean... You wake up like, that's what happened to me last night? Damn. We, we know teams are using technological means yeah. for athletic espionage. This happens in Major League Baseball. Ask the Astros. Well, yeah, we know the boys NFL, hack We know the NFL people are brazen, i.e. Belichick. Uh, they will film you on the sidelines yeah. and actually do it again even after they've been caught. Yep. That's Bill Belichick and the Patriots. So you combine those two aspects, and I totally agree. Desmond Harrison, guys, just looking, looking at this. I'm just looking at his Wikipedia page, so take Wikipedia for what it's worth. On June 15th, so signs with the Browns as an undrafted free agent. Has a good mini camp, gets named their starting left tackle for the opener. Hmm. Think of all the issues he had at Texas and having to go like to West Georgia or wherever he ended up coming out of, hmm. Alabama, Central A&M or whatever, wherever it was. <laughs> uh, starting left tackle. Hugh Jackson gets fired. Hmm. Greg Williams gets oh, hired. Hugh. He benches Desmond Harrison, still with the Browns going into 2019, gets waived on June 5th quote, after, a caused, after 
a missed flight caused him to miss his first day of Cleveland's mandatory wow. mini camp. Deemed one too many missteps for Harrison. The next day, Rod That's crazy. gets claimed by the Cardinals. Yeah. And he was only released uh, following news of assault allegations and a felony arrest warrant in North Carolina. He was starting for the Browns. I, he was so, just starting yeah. left tackle. So Mac wasn't wrong about his talent level. Yeah. He was, it's also the risk Mac always talked about with Juco guys. Couldn't get you don't know exactly what you're getting. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's crazy. I, I, I didn't even know that timeline. That's sad, man. Juco's, Juco's, I mean, sometimes you get Donald Hawkins or Jeff Swain. Sometimes you get Brandon Moore and Tyreek Hill. Desmond Harrison. Yeah. Never know. It's a toss up. Yeah. But so to take it back to current time, so Denzel Okafor's out of the portal. Rod, let's get your quick thoughts. Uh, my opinion on this is Desmond, Har- Desmond Harrison, Denzel Okafor doesn't need to be great to be what Texas needs him to be. He just needs to be good enough to where he can lock down one of those two starting jobs on the offensive line, probably either right tackle or right guard if Junior Aguilar moves to left guard. And at least from a depth standpoint, I feel the same way I do now when he put his name in the portal. It doesn't kill you, but from a depth standpoint, you'd like to have a guy that's played as much football as he has, that's been in the program as yeah. long as he has, and at least has some starting experience. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't know, other than him wanting attention or why he would put his name in the transfer portal, I assume that he, he nobody's – guaranteed him a starting spot and that hasn't really been discussed and he's probably been discussed as one of many options at those two positions you talked about i agree i think junior angola is going to end up starting we know cosme is you know your left tackle preseason all american yeah cursor is probably going to end up at center just because of the uh, the importance of the position and his skill level overall we know he can play any position on the old line but right now the most important position for you on that O-line to get solidified is at center, and you don't have an offseason right now, so you can't afford to experiment. You don't, matter of fact, you don't have time to experiment right. nope. with, with you know other guys in there and younger guys at that position. Mm-hmm. So if you do have your, your left side solidified, man, her hand, that, to me, the job is pretty easy. And if you're Denzel Okafor and you have more starting experience than you know, that basically that pool of young guys that they're going to be uh, trying to, uh, you're going to be competing with, you should – you should definitely end up locking down one of those starting spots. I, that's why I said I don't understand why he would put his name in the transfer portal when he was projected by most people, and we are not the we are not behind the burnt orange curtain. But most of us projected he'd be a starter on that O line. So staff I, didn't want him to leave, and I, I, well, I think this is the one of the problems with the portal. Not that it's a problem because. You guys know I'm for the portal. I'm for mm-hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, until you're going to pay players, the more rights and privileges you can give them, I'm all for it. A predicament that comes with it. But this is this is one of the problems with the portal is you don't have to run it by the head coach to put your name in the portal. Mm-mm. You just go to compliance, and from the time you tell compliance you want in, they've got 48 hours to post your name. Yep. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's what the process is. I like that so process actually. Mm-hmm. You've got you've got some situations where a head coach. Only party has to hear involved. from his football ops guy, hey, you know, uh, you know Joe Smith is in the portal? Like, I just talked to him two days ago, and he was fine. Why is he in the portal? <laughs> so, well, well, I don't know. Did I communicate well with him? And that's, I yeah. mean, that's It shouldn't have to go through the coaches, the but the coaches are going to abuse that. We've been seeing over, right. over the years that coaches abuse their power. So yeah. you can't, the whole point is to empower the, the student athletes to give them an option outside of the coaching staff and their influence over the players. Just their own we personal know, right. Sitting in, a conference, sitting in a room with a coach, they have a tremendous amount of influence over mm-hmm. those players and what they could say. Trust me, as a guy, they would bring you in every year to sign the scholarship. And if you didn't sign the scholarship, trust me, I mean, I'm sure there would be issues. I, I know a few guys who didn't sign it, and it was always a big thing. All right. Now yeah. you shouldn't sign anything unless you have somebody read it. These days they tell you as an adult, do not sign anything unless you have a professional, a lawyer read that document. And yet, student athletes all over the country, all they do is sign documents that they don't read. They may yeah. read it, but they have no idea what the language means, unless and they have no idea who to go. Who do you go tell? Who do you go ask? Hey. Come in here and read this document for me and tell me about my rights as a student athlete. Nobody ever will. So I like what they're doing. I think it's necessary. The whole point is if these young men would be, I think if they were being taught the right thing, like like I was by my father when I was being recruited, he told me, hey, man, if you're going to 
X off Oklahoma State and Texas Tech off your list. Call those guys and tell them. Tell the, tell the coach so he's not wasting his damn time. Partly because my dad got tired of them sending letters and calling. He's like, man, you just tell them dudes how to call yeah, there. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not going to go me. there, they're wasting their time and you're wasting my time. Yeah. So I would have to do that, which was very difficult for a 17-year-old. Oh, a youngster, to call man. Them and tell, you know, tell Joe Paterno. It's like business and training. Like, nah, That's a sorry, good father right I'm there. I'm not going to tell Bobby Bowden that you don't, you don't want to go to your school. And, you know, those guys would be on the phone and trying to, you know, persuade you up the other way. Um, so it's an awkward conversation that these young men should be having. But when you have coaches who are willing to leave their jobs without ever talking to their teams, when you have coaches who will pretend to go to the bathroom at a recruiting dinner like Tommy Tuberville and then leave and never come back and ghost his team and take on the job, <laughs> that's wrong. We have Randy yeah. Edsel who will do the same thing. His team finds out uh, on, on a call on Sports Center that he took another job uh, with Maryland. And now I think he's back at UConn. You have all these stories. Manny Diaz is another one of those guys. Temple yeah. took the job for, I don't know, three Five weeks days. or something and decided to leave. And when you have those well, kinds of stories, did his. When you have those kinds of stories when grown men won't even have the awkward conversation with a young person and go, listen, things in life change. When you have a family, you're gonna you're gonna be in a situation just like this where you're gonna have to decide what's best for you, your goals, your aspirations, your faith. They don't want to have that conversation because they're worried about money. That's what drives everything. Mm -hmm. So in that case, give these young men rights. They're already employees. They don't treat them like that. Give them rights. They should have to tell the coach a damn thing. Yeah. The coach, because the coaches now, they're mad because they gotta keep recruiting these kids for four or five years. That's what they're they used to be is. bring them on campus. I just I was one of those guys, they come in and recruit you. And they deep recruit you. Gotcha. Like trash when you get on campus because you know you That's got no gotcha. other options. Yeah, yeah. Go, go transfer. And you right. transfer back in the day. It was a scarlet letter. Everybody Don't talk like, back oh, to me. Oh man, you must have transferred because you did something dirty. You got arrested, yep. or you must be a problem child, or something like that. Now everybody can transfer, and it's not you're not a problem child. You just didn't like that situation you were in, and we all agree. Hey, just like marriage. Sometimes you know what? Me and her, we were in love, but now we're not in love. And only it's an adult conversation we can have. And now those coaches. They don't like it because their hypocrisy is being thrown in their face. Just like they used to yep. leave their jobs and not say a damn thing to the team. Now mm -hmm. these young men can leave that team and not say a damn thing to the coach. They're getting a little bit of their taste their own message, and they don't like it. And you brought it up. I mean, it was Mark Rick just signed that class and then just retired, just left Florida to yeah, cause the Manny thing. Man. But think about that idea that yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, wait, actually, I changed my mind. I'm going to not coach again. Which is fine. And then, Which is fine. But, but, but tell, be, be respectful. Exactly. And the conversation you had about, you know, signing it, having to come up and sign this piece of paper, just sign away, whatever you... Come on, and, sign this piece of paper, son. Come get your meal. And then you know who didn't right. sign that? <laughs> you didn't sign, well, you know you ain't gonna get your meal. Or, 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 or room and board. Oh, oh, damn, I just want somebody to read it. Well, we gotta hurry up. We, got, we only got a couple of minutes. If y'all remember <laughs> old Wooderson, his speech on the 50-yard line of Burger Center, and he was the one talking about Randall Pink Floyd, who wouldn't sign the piece of paper, yeah. dazed and confused the whole time, and Wooderson McConaughey told him that every, all your life there's going to be somebody trying to get you to sign something in on, this man. whole speech. So it's funny that we actually have Wooderson at campus that could be the guy <laughs> telling Randall Pink Floyd to not Don't sign shine, these man. things, come out to the 50-yard line with me. And, I mean, that's literally what McConaughey's role was in Days and Confused. That's awesome. So with Denzel Okafor, though, yeah, and I'm Rod, I'd have to go back. I haven't done it yet. I'd have to go back and look at timelines on when stuff was announced in terms of extending dead periods and when he went in, et cetera, et cetera. I would think he probably, and I don't know, I haven't talked to Denzel Okafor. I only know, I only know what I know. <laughs> but I, w I would think he probably put his name in there thinking, okay, maybe I need to give myself some options, and then probably realizing, well, you don't know when this dead period is going to end, when you're going to be able to make a campus visit, what That's things are going to look like. And honestly, at this point, I think for a lot of coaches, right, I think this goes for Texas, because we heard Texas maybe going in, not her, I, I, I know from some of the sources I talked to, they were looking in the portal for maybe a receiver or maybe some linebacker help, a couple of areas. I think at this point, especially when we talk about the offensive line, at this point, what's that old saying? It's probably – better the devil you know than the one you don't. Stick with the devil it, you know. It, it's <laughs> probably a situation where you're thinking, okay, you. yeah, we could maybe go into the portal for help, but if you can get Denzel Okafor back, and you know what, you probably like to not have be in a situation where you've got to say, okay, is it Willie Tyler or Topi Amati? Can one of those guys figure it out? Or Tyler Johnson or Christian Jones? Can one of those guys figure it out? Probably better to do that with guys that have been in your program than rolling the dice on a grad transfer that – at this point, you don't know when you're even going to be able to meet with them. Now you're right about it's like the COVID nineteen that that domino effect is having all throughout sports, mm -hmm. specifically football. 
and I said this about the NFL, but I think it applies to college football as well. Hell, it'll, it'll apply to high school football. God willing, we have a season. You're now, if you're a coach, you're thinking about, all right, who's the guy that ran that system last year? Because I don't really have an offseason to teach a new system mm -hmm. to a guy, teach new technique to a guy. You know what I mean? Get to know another player. So if you're a veteran who's already a coach already knows, you have a tremendous advantage yep. now at, at, in two-a-day competition or to make that roster. Okay? High football IQ guys, right? too. Like the, well, those football, are, but that's going to be, I got to get to know you. Know yep, you football exactly. IQ. Nope. I, don't, I don't got time to get to know you. Right now, I need to know, can, do you know how to run my system? You know how to run it? Man, you know what? Nope. I'll take him. But the other guy, he's faster and he's more talented. Yeah, but I ain't got an offseason to teach him my damn system, so I yep. might not even be able to get the most out of him. And that's what, honestly, bringing back Herb Hand out of all the offensive coaches, uh, and uh, Stan Drayton, too, of course. Safe area. The Herb, Herb Hand thing is huge now. Mm hmm Considering yeah. you had no, think about you had no offseason and had to get a new offensive lineman, mm. new, new technique, new concepts, new scheme. That'd be brutal. But at least Herb Hand knows the players, knows the personnel, and go, no, 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 this guy can do that, this guy can't. Because, like you said, right now, you got to go with what you know. You don't even have an offseason to see if now a guy like Denzel Logan, is if he is an improved tackle or an improved guard. Now you got to go off what you know from last year. He was a better guard than a tackle. All right, let's go. All right, let's put him at guard. You know what I mean? Like you, because you don't have time to make a proper evaluation because you don't have an off season. And then it becomes okay if he's a guard, then okay for that other starting spot. Willie Tyler Topi Amati, you're out of the mix now. It's Tyler Johnson or Christian Jones. Because I don't have time to experiment. Right. It's brutal. Well, well but, but if you're smart, if you're a good problem solver, you can. You know, I think you can work your work your way around it. But man, it's. It's going to be brutal for a lot of guys. Yeah, I know. Is this where, like, Saban has his 100 analysts at home, like, droning through? Like, this is where those organizational skills and being yep. able to understand and trust your employees and that your employees yes. are doing what you need them to do, that they have the minds to be able to do it. And, like, I mean, you can marry all of these things conceptually man. together for, as a coaching staff. Oh, and organize everything. The implementation is going to be tough because of the uh, reaching the kids whenever you can't be there. But still, the ones that have it together, it's going to be more evident than any other time than the ones that don't. It's hard enough as it is to work for Nick Saban. Can you imagine being one of his analysts <laughs> where he knows you don't Charlie. have Charlie, you've got nothing but time. Yeah. No, yeah. that's a great <laughs> point. But I will say this is when a uh, huge support Hit your staff, quotas, your film quotas. Huge support staff has got to be big now. You know, think about some schools, small support staffs right now. Yeah. Getting all the video to the players, splicing up all the clips, and, ooh, it's brutal. You got a big support staff now, you just dish, you just, you Easy. just delegating, uh, you know, orders to get different guys. Get this to this guy, do this, do that. Uh, it, it's harder to organize, but at least you do have the foot soldiers to carry it out. Some schools right now, Small support staff. Yeah. I can't even imagine yeah. how all the different duties and responsibilities now you thought you had, but now, oh no, you got to do like five or six different jobs. Even like the lesser power five schools. Texas State. They yeah. Texas State School. Oh, well, my God. They yeah. got a huge support staff. When you got an incompetent AD, that doesn't help either. Yeah. <laughs> and then the new coach. I thought about that. He was wearing his shirt. Jab, it was total jab <laughs> yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. So. Um. But, yeah. I, you know, it, I, but I think for Tom Herman in this, right, I want to get back to Denzel Logan for here in a second, this offensive line, but. You know, when you, when you think about how Tom Herman wanted this coaching transition to go where he wanted somebody to take control of the offense, all Mike Yersich has on his hands right now is time. And so it's like, hey, you want to dive in? He mentioned, uh, he, Tom Herman did, uh, he did a radio interview on the whole with Bucky and Aaron uh, Tuesday morning and said Mike Yersich called him like Monday evening. He said, hey, uh, I've been watching film all day. I got a couple questions about some of the things you guys did last year. Tom Herman said, like, you've been watching film all day. I've been pressure washing my back patio. Like, you're... Bringing down film, okay, great. But that's the kind of thing. <laughs> Tom Herman actually say that. He actually said that. Hmm. But it, you but, getting a little chummy, going a little Mac Brown line there. But if if you're, I hope he was just being joking. Chummy. I hope yeah. that was just hyper. But yeah. no, but here's the thing though. Not, <laughs> it's not, it's not the, taking it seriously. For what he needed, for what he needs, he that, needed that offensive coordinator hired to be. He needed a guy that's going to live in the film room. I know, but I would hope that he would also be in that field. Yeah, because, you, yeah, cause, yeah your time, washing the back. talking about allocating <laughs> duties. But maybe he had just watched film, but he didn't want a break. A so break. I, I, you know what? I'm not judging. This sounded like Mike Yersitz going uh, <sighs> overtime on the film stuff. I, well, this is the time where everybody should be going over. This is the perfect time for you to reverse engineer almost every part of your football program and football team. If, if, if I am... Tom Herman right now, I want my defensive coordinator, Chris Ash, to break down Texas offense, and I want him to tell me all this crap that's wrong with it, how he would defend it, 
and how he was shut down Texas offense, how he was shut down Sam Ellinger. Give me a scouting report on all of our wide outs that's coming back, DBs, everything. Let me know exactly how you would defend us and beat us. And I want Mike Yurst to do the same thing to our defense. That's what Saban's doing. doing. You would disassemble this damn defense and embarrass this damn defense, and I want to know exactly how you'd do it. And then that's going to give me, because they're fresh eyes, by the way, fresh Mm -hmm. eyes. And then that's going to give me a little bit of a perspective to go, okay, damn. That's pretty. If they saw that, then their breakdown, um, that's something that we talked about in our meetings before I fired all my damn coaches. Mm-hmm. That is that's that that is a weakness. That is a it, it, you know that is a weak, an internal weakness I got to deal with because I should have saw that. If they can see it, I should have saw it. And mm-hmm. I never saw it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't. You know what I mean? So I hope stuff like that's going on. Yeah, those and now it's like you said intelligence type. Exactly, and that's the type of stuff that right now like. Got you, time. Yeah, other times <laughs> you have, time. like, other distractions or, like, you're on campus and you have yeah. people talking to you and stuff. Like, right now is the one time so when, when those things it. should be done most. He dies. Or that's just what football coaches that are maniacal do. So, Rod, is it safe to say with this offensive line, like you said, you don't have a lot of time to experiment. So, if you're mm-hmm. Herb Hand, you're basically going off, okay, what were the last notes that I had, which probably was, what, bowl practice? The yeah, that's actually a good point. On-campus bowl practice yeah. is probably the last good look. That's a great point because a lot of young it. players, they get reps from bowl yeah. practice. So he's got to make a call. He's really got to make the call now. Like, okay, um, is Rafiti Gramai, like you talk about, like we love Derek Kerstetter for the versatility because mm-hmm. he can play anywhere. If you're Herb Handy, you have to almost make the call now and say, you know what, I don't think Rafiti Gramai is going to be ready to be a starting center right now. Given the time crunch, I just don't think he's going to get enough reps by the time you get to September 5th. Mm-hmm. You know, it starts September 5th. Yeah. You just have to make the determination now. Derek Kirster is my starting center. Yeah. No question. You can't even, because you, you can't take a chance on, all right, you know what, I'm going to assume Grandma is going to be ready. You can't make any assumptions. Like you said, your bold notes, those are your last notes, and you said, uh, you know, this guy was trending. You like this guy moving to tackle a guard. That's what you got to go off of because, as you pointed out, man, that's, that's a good chance, you know, you won't you won't see these guys until fall camp if God willing we have a season. You won't see them until. You then. figure, especially since Texas is, is already announced they're doing their first online. summer session online. You're not going to see these guys until summer too at the earliest. Yeah, for sure. At the earliest, and I, I hope that's the case. I yeah, all best case, case scenario. But, but and so you you must go about your business as if they're you know the season will happen on time and all of that, uh, the best as you can considering that we're all shelter shelter in place. But also, you do have to plan for the worst case scenario, which is not the worst case. That means there's no season. But if you start have to start later and you don't get that off season to experiment and to evaluate, and you go, all right, Kirster's my center, Cosby's my left tackle, Ungalau my left guard, left side is solidified. Or do you want to, you know, what I mean, maybe you want to put Ungalau on, you know, right guard. Like I don't know exactly how you want to do. It. I assume they want to solidify one side. They'd rather have that left yeah. side. Yeah. And then you can always. Make you can you can make different adjustments to the right side. The underrated thing about that too is last year between right tackle and right guard, Cosme and Kirsch that are played next to each other, or Kirsch that are Angulao played next to each other. So uh, you know maybe maybe that, yeah, that kind of chemistry. Point. It's diff- and we know the guard center relationship is different than the guard tackle relationship. No but at least you get some synergy there. They move an Angulao to the okay. left side. And, I like that. And, and basically saying. I'm, I'm with you, Rod, with this line of thinking. I, I think Herb Hamm will look at it and say, you know what? I can, I'm can. i banking on these three guys. And my left side of my offensive line is just going to be badass. And yeah. from left tackle to center, that's where we're going to be you really dominate. good. Yeah. Uh, or, like you said, you can move Angela over to right guard, Keep still have there. that synergy, and then you can be able to mitigate any damage done by Okafor by putting them on the left side in between your two best offensive linemen. Yeah. Cosme and Kerstetter. And, and, and then, you know, only so much damage he can do there. You can only screw up so much if I put you between two of the best offensive linemen in the country mm-hmm. and then have Angela over there and then maybe you'd have better synergy, as you pointed out. Well, and then you also have two guys that have experienced previously in multiple positions. So in worst case scenario, you sort of have manufactured depth just with your personnel amongst the starters, say – one guy gets hurt and you're able to move somebody over. The last thing you want is Kerstetter to get hurt because that would be the one replacement that doesn't necessarily have a true backup. And then, but the idea that if somebody else gets hurt, if you were to get a center to come and be at least serviceable, you're able to also manufacture depth out with Kerstetter. And then the idea that Ungalau could play alongside, he played a different position last year. So that at least helps manufacture where we were talking about the 
best times at Texas football, you had almost two full lines. Like I was watching that Kansas State Texas game from whenever Vince Young sprained his ankle and it's sort of when he took over and like they talk about how you literally brought in the second wave like they subbed out all five for five and the new five coming in was the young future foundational five. You need a back, yeah, you do need a backup center. That's got to be like top three priorities for him. Uh, we're for your mind's development, which Rod takes me to the next thing I wanted to discuss that Tom Herman mentioned in the teleconference. You know, he mentioned nutrition and workouts for his players while they're off campus is probably his number one priority. That's just, this is this impacts your big guys way more than it impacts your skill guys. Yeah. Because, like we said, the earliest at this point guys are going to get back on campus is summer two. If you're Yancey McKnight, when you start looking at bodies in terms of what they look like once you eyeball guys face to face again. Could you be looking at a bunch of big guys? And this isn't a Texas issue. This is a national. This is every program in the country is going to be dealing with this. Is that your worst fear as a strength coach? Is getting guys back in the building and saying, "Damn, everything we did from in winter conditioning is gone, and we're starting back at square one." Uh, yeah, I could see that because uh-huh. you know. So when you talk, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but when you talk about worst case scenarios, is that Yancey McKnight's worst case scenario that? The big bodies are just is basically going to be starting over at square one. I think that's that's very realistic, actually. That's where it, socioeconomically everybody's now on the same plane. These guys are at home, mm-hmm. so we don't know what equipment they have available to them yep. at home to work out, and some of them have none. And these days, most guys don't have any. Just back when I was coming up, I mean, I think guys had equipment just kind of at the house, you know, weights and different things like that. Now, the modernization of workouts and guys working out. The, at the in these camps, camps and work and workout facilities and mm-hmm. going to gyms a lot of guys don't have anything at the house you know what i mean they just go out to work out and if you're a skilled guy I, i'm with you i think you can find a field somewhere and go yeah. do some drills in and be okay yeah, all right go hurt your walk or do push up do do crunches but if you're if you're a 300 pound human being you need you need girt you need something massive to lift on you know what i mean and well, also in nutrition in way, and yeah, then being able so to lean i think for those guys it could end up being yeah hugely detrimental I, I don't know you know I think socioeconomically I'd worry about some of those big guys just being able to get enough calories throughout the day to keep up the, max the right ones because shrinking. you have nutritionists nowadays mm-hmm. but yeah, that's only in the past decade that you've seen that even in your college football programs and when you're on campus those things are a lot easily able to just be able to adapt down and change your lifestyle but then whenever it's not available to you by no fault of your own you just aren't going to be able to have those opportunities when you're away and that's where like basically you're going to either have if you systemically within say your workout program have good habits and like say Yancey McKnight has sort of ingrained these into the veterans if you even had like a team of just like a self-led like sort of what you hear from the 05 team a lot of guys that would just do it themselves in their rack post where like you'll just have certain groups that may be way better than others teams and if you have a Mm -hmm. lackadaisical work nature or just strength program anything like that those could be the ones that suffer here in the offseason and i'm not just talking about guys you know getting heavy guys looking like me walking through the door god knows tom herman doesn't need any of that but the opposite I'm talking about like if if you're Yancey McKnight and you have a defensive lineman that you bulked up to 280 pounds, and all of a sudden he comes back in the door at 255. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I think yeah. the shrinkage yeah. is what's going to happen to a lot of guys. You've been like putting Costanza? muscle mass on. Yeah. 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 You know what I'm saying? I think that's what you're worried about. And I, I know they have you know unlimited snacks now, so I wonder how many meals and how many snacks they can send guys. Yeah. You know, based on now, the because they are still You're on right. scholarship, I, I think there is a meal plan. I think yeah. they're still there working is. that out. So yeah. I don't know what the what the NCAA has interpreted as, you know, unlimited snacks and the mm. meal plan. Because they still can send them meals and stuff. You're right about now, that. Now, logistically, how do, you get that, how do you get that delivered in a day and age we're in a COVID-19 crisis? And even Amazon saying, listen, essential items, folks. Don't be trying yeah. to get dildos from it's us right you now. You can't be sending you know, hundreds back order. and sending so, meals hundreds of miles. And how safe is that? You know yeah. what I mean? And the people that prepare these meals and stuff like that. I don't know what they're All doing. of it's it, crazy. They they can, still, are you going to give people like a gift card and say you can go use it at your local establishment? Mm-hmm. Are you going to give them like a, a visa gift card and say, all right, you, you can use it. And then the, the nutritionist or the dietitian says, all right, this is what you go buy. buy, buy Show me your stuff. receipts. Get salmon. Yeah, because you don't know <laughs> no what they're buying. Some parents are probably taking it and go, nah, we need that for food, for well, our food. Well, that's what I'm saying. So what I, I don't know. Hey, Matt Brown brought that up. He was like, we, they're getting checks. The guys are getting checks, but I can't tell you what happens to the checks once they get to the house. Well, yeah. Yeah, no, that check could happen. Yeah. Once it gets to the house, mama could take that check. Mama might need that check. Mm-hmm. So if mama take that check because she needs it, 
especially right now. And we, ain't, we can't do anything about it. Yeah, so even Mac acknowledged it, it's going to be really, really dicey how we chop all this up. That's, yeah. a scenario no Tom Herman, that's a scenario Tom Herman brought up. Like, let's say, I think he said, because, you know, the cost of living adjustment mm -hmm. and scholarship, he said, guys probably under scholarship checks probably get about, I think he said about eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars $1,900 a month. But he said, if you're at home now, and mom it's like you, a, your bowl well, checks. Your mom worked at a server at a restaurant mm -hmm. and all of a sudden she didn't have coming in. Guess what that eight, eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars yeah. is doing? Come on, it's going to pay a cell phone bill or a light bill or, or yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that's I mean, it's and like you said, this isn't obviously a problem limited to Texas. I mean, this is gonna be something every program in the country is yeah. dealing with. So are they getting the uh so they get an adjusted income on the stipend because they don't get room and board? Is that are they getting that adjustment too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And their cost of living, just everything, yeah. since you basically are under their. Yeah, yeah. It's online yeah. schooling and everything. You got the tuition well, you know and the scholarship about, right I, now. I'm sure things pass fail. So, I mean, honestly. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not going to. Nobody's giving grades I'll out. Damn, man, I, I nobody's giving grades out. I don't think we're going to have many. I think every LA be pass fail. And you know what? I, I'm going to throw it out there. Everybody in the country is going to pass. Yes. No kid, NCAA no isn't going to say at that. Any <laughs> level of school and education will fail at any college, at any high school, junior high, elementary. There's no teacher out there or professor that's going to fail a student during the COVID-19 crisis. Everybody will pass. I will tell you this. There are, and some people will make it else, and they're like, yes, everybody's back. I think Austin now is pass fail. Now, and you're right about fail. this because like, right? yeah. collegiately, I mean, you got uh, what, pass. the NCAA going to go and rule you ineligible during this? But yeah. since my mom is point. a teacher. I would she, cheat. If I was a college program, I would cheat right now. Because very what, first, are gonna do? what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, what are you going to do? My mom has <laughs> caught second graders <laughs> cheating already. Like, she's a second grade teacher, and one of the friends was posing as him taking tests logged in as him, <laughs> little Jimmy, I don't know their names, came over and my mom busted this kid impersonating this other hey. kid in her class. It's like, so they're, they're going to be doing it all over oh, everywhere. You know that's gonna your girlfriend's going to be taking your quizzes. You're taking, hell, you have people getting all A's because other people will be taking their tests for them. Starting in the SEC, you know. Some oh, yeah, going on. for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a whole whole different case. <laughs> like, how are you going to track it, though? The point is, it's this so is why hard. you can cheat because the NCAA, they're literally having to change the rules real time. And with Google? They're having, because they're, there are no rules for this. There are no rules for a pandemic. So they're changing the rules. Even Tom Herman talked about, like, man, they had, it's because the Big 12 screwed Tom Herman. But they, they had the SEC doing things that the Big 12 wasn't allowing the Big 12 schools to do. Yeah, it's Because absurd. the NCAA doesn't really have the uniform rules for this. It's kind of the wild, wild west. We so talked about if this. if I was Tom Herman, I would find basically the equivalent of a tax person for the NCAA code and I find me every loophole. Yep. I mean every loophole that applies to this pandemic that I can do if I can send them freaking uh, you know exercise equipment what can I say I, I want whatever I can do I want to be able to do it. Now. Find out what I'm not allowed to do. Find and out if, what I'm not and allowed and to if do. If and anything I'll do else if there's no rule against the, it. Exactly. It's just like when new technology emerges and there's an infancy period before anything is legalized and you're in that sort exactly. of odd pandemic era that we're in right now. You could always go oh we can't do that during the pandemic. There was no rule like against George Costanza. it. Like George Costanza. Yep. You, you know what? You're right. I had no I clue. Had no Should I not done that? Right. Is that a bad idea? If somebody had told me that I wasn't supposed to do yeah, that, I, you know what? I wouldn't have I done, done it. it. There you go. I, th I think some coaches, Nick Saban, chief among them, are taking the approach of better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, one of the things Alabama is kind of under fire for right now, they sent all their players to tr try to track what they're doing. Sent all of them Apple Watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey. And now people are like, well, hey, you can't do that. Nick Saban's like, hey, nobody said that. <laughs> Pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, track them, it's health. <laughs> Pandemic, I'm playing the COVID card. Boom. Yeah. Play the, that's all right, man. Play the Until COVID Until you card. make a rule against it, hey, I'm going to do it. Chris Del Conte used the COVID card, uh, you know, to not fire Shaka. Yeah. And then hired a new uh, women's basketball coach. You can play that COVID card when you want to, and you can play it when you know. It all depends on how you feel that day. You know what I mean? So uh, <laughs> one thing I wanted, to, one thing, two things I wanted to get to, and we talked about the offensive line already, but uh, you know, in the Tom Herman teleconference last week, Rod, he talked about you know the two position groups that were top of mind for him in terms of what were top priorities. He mentioned offensive line and linebacker. And the more I think about linebacker, it, it is going to be once they get back to to actual football stuff, that position is going to be a complete crapshoot because I can't tell you what the best approach Chris Ash should take and Coleman Hutzler should take at that position. Because think about this. Their two most experienced guys, mm -hmm. Delia Dayaway and Jawan Mitchell, who don't have that much experience, but it is what it is. The two most experienced guys are guys that Chris Ash didn't call them out, but he basically said, didn't call these guys out specifically, didn't mention them by name. 
But he said in his press conference in February, when you're looking for linebackers in this league, it might not be a guy who's 6'2", 6'3", 240 pounds because those guys can have trouble in space. And as we saw last year, one of my chief complaints about Todd Orlando's defense was you can have Delia Dayway on the field or you can have Jawan Mitchell on the field. Mm-hmm. If you've got both those guys on the field in this league, you're going to get exposed. Trouble. Mm-hmm. So there's that. I think there's two guys in that room who fit the body types and the skill sets Chris Ash wants with David Benda and Marcus Tillman. But David Benda is coming off of an Alamo Bowl where he was sent home for violation team rules. Mm-hmm. So you don't know where he's at in the pecking order. And secondly, Del- uh, Marcus Tillman's coming off knee surgery. He's at the tail end of the rehab. But you don't know. But, but you don't know. so much you don't know. So then there's the complete wild card in this whole mix, which is DeMarvion Overshaw. Who's moving to Will? Moving to Will linebacker, which, by the way, the linebacker tagging system has changed now. It's not Mac and Rover. It's Mike and Will. You're more traditional. What is his hybrid? What is his B-backer or Fox? That Jack position, which is going to function He's more like the Jack. Jack. A C D C. Like if you think He's got if, if you think uh, think of Will Muschamp, how Will Muschamp used the buck, Buck, that's how Chris yeah. Ashley used the Jack. He's it's like gonna be Fox more of a true defensive end than the than the hybrid. So hey everybody, more four man front. You get to see more four man front. As long as Joseph Asai is on the front, I, I'm cool. Like as like, long as, Joseph Asai is supposed to be Yes, this, he's gonna uh, be the Jack. As long as jack, he's yeah. look, as long as he's not thirty yards down the field covering space, I'm cool. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I want to see that. Yeah. Well, and we talked about earlier about, you know, that 05 team in its core and how the D-line was so deep. And then, you know, of course, that secondary you so deep. Forget about those linebacks in 05. You didn't need them. Yeah. No, right. no, 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 no disrespect That's to my them. point. But you had the greatest secondary in the history of Texas football, along with one of the greatest D-lines in the history of Texas football. So, was it Al? Bobino. Oh, Rashad Bobino, Robert Killebrew, Aaron Harris. Aaron Harris, And leftover yeah. Harris. And, and no, no, those oh, guys man. were awesome, but listen. You, I mean, and that's my point. <laughs> Look at that Matt Butler out yep. there running down. <laughs> I, I would have <laughs> concussed myself immediately, but I would have tried my damnedest. Say, those, I mean, those two groups were so formidable. You know? Yep. And, and they, but they, were, they, were, they were good linebackers, but there's a reason people forget about the linebacker. But it's interesting, though, when, you look, same with that, 08? when you look at that yeah. linebacker group in 05, like – You've got those three guys, Bobino, Killebrew, and Aaron Harris. Rod, you played with, I don't think you played with Robert Killebrew, but you played with Aaron Harris briefly. That linebacker group doesn't translate to football in 2019. No. But what's interesting about that group, you've got a guy in Drew Kelson who was way ahead of his time. I think if Drew Kelson were in college football now, you put him at a starting linebacker spot and not think twice about it. Yeah. Well, that's why DeMarvion Overshone's Mm -hmm. transition. And I heard you talking about it uh, on the show today with Craig. It's it's big. It's huge. B.J. Foster's development is big because those are guys essentially in today's football who are essentially hybrid, strong safety linebacker types. You know what I mean? They're, uh, they call them the flex, uh, position flex these days. Uh, you can call them hybrids, whatever. They're different names for them, but they're all guys who basically can be either a linebacker for you or a safety depending on the particular matchup. And those guys are becoming more and more popular. Isaiah Simmons will be drafted in top the top five, I think, mm-hmm. uh, because he is that guy. And, and right now, they still don't know what he is. They say, he's a linebacker, and he's insulted by them calling him a linebacker mm-hmm. because he's going to lose money that yeah. way. Yeah. Because he's not a pass-rushing outside linebacker. He's a linebacker. They say, no, he's going to lose, lose money. Don't call, don't call me a linebacker. Safety, Nicole. Call me a safety mm-hmm. or better yet, you know what I mean, make up something new for me yeah. like uh, Brent Venables did. Whatever and the I rover. Texas wants DeMarvio and Overshaw to be Isaiah Simmons light. He's not going to be Isaiah Simmons because that dude is a physical freak of nature. But he can fulfill some of the same roles. You want him to master something first. Uh, but it, it, we come, a, we come a, a, a long way in a short time when, you know, I remember when Tom Herman was talking about Breck and Hager, and he literally called them a tweener. He's like, he's a tweener. We don't really know what to do with him. And then within that, you know, that lightning package, they start using Breck and Hager, and then he starts referring to him as a hybrid. And now in the NFL, they call him position flex. Those are yeah. the guys. That's what they keep calling Isaiah Simmons. So you can tell even in real time, in like five or six years, we've already started to covet those guys now because in the modern day of football, the Drew Kelsons of the world are actually what you prefer because mm-hmm. they are not a matchup disadvantage in any way right. at any time. You can make a lot of with a wide receiver, a tight end, running back, 
I'll be good. Oh, you want to run against them? They can stop the run, too. Yeah, and the players and coaches nowadays really seem to not care as much about those labels, but it seems the front office is, is where do. the conflict becomes yep. because franchise you're trying tags. to pay these people, yeah. and they have these, exactly like you said, the franchise tags, or then you have valuations of positions and how much allocation to salary yeah. cap and players like Simmons. You know, those don't work either waters for outsiders, but if you're talking about the football, it's only an advantageous situation that the players and coaches yeah. know and understand, yet the labeling can cause conflict amongst the front office and then the actual football implementation. But you'll see more and more or less and less of actual like positions being used that way. It's just going to be weird to see how the NFL deals with that on the front office. No, you're aspect. so right. It's, it's like Jimmy Graham, right? He mm -hmm. wanted to be a wide receiver because tight ends were getting mm -hmm. paid less. Yep. They, they said he was a tight end. Le'Veon Bell wanted to be a wide receiver because yeah. he and had 94 he targets. But, exactly. He's like, but, man, I, I ran 50% of my routes out of the, the slot. Exactly. He's, he's like, like yeah. I caught more balls in your damn wide house. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, but that's a great point. It's like they're all, they're all prostitutes, but a hooker is paid less than a call girl, mm -hmm. and an escort is paid more mm -hmm. than, you know, a hook, hooker is paid less than a call girl, but a hooker is also at the bottom of that hierarchy. Then a call girl is a little bit above her, so a, hooker, a call girl is paid more. And then the escort is paid the most. Escort are paid for their time. Yeah. They're not necessarily paid for the act or for whatever it is. And it's the same thing that's happening, right? That's what a tweener, a hybrid, and a position flex are. It's just labels, but those labels, you pointed out, they yeah. have a price tag. Yeah, exactly. Those labels have a they price tag. They mean something. Even though something, they don't mean right? something on the field, they yeah. mean something in the front office. And we're talking about big business. Like, there's a way that you need to marry those things and that's sort of where yeah. the X's and O's conflict with the front offices in that aspect. Gentlemen, anything else before we wrap it up this week? You guys got anything else on your mind? Um, yeah, I got a lot on my mind. But yeah, tons time. of stuff on my <laughs> mind. We'll fit it in next week. But I have been, while we're sitting here, I'm going to delete out a lot of our old school uh, shows from the SoundCloud page just so all of our interviews go up to the top. So if y'all want to go back and listen, because when I was putting together the oh, yeah. best of stuff, there's so much old funny stuff that we have just sitting around there that maybe fans haven't listened to. So if y'all have some time during the COVID and want to just hear random during Earl Thomas COVID. after winning a Super Bowl or awesome. a random BJ Johnson or random whoever, there's like, you know, anybody from your Iraq pose to your Shipley's to Achos to Lamar Houston. Lamar Houston cracking up about Mush Champ, which is still one of my favorite ones. You can uh, you can hear Earl Thomas tell Rod B he's still got the best feet in the world. Man, I need to go hear that. I need that. That's that's pretty awesome. I need that actually sent to me. Yeah, so I have it on my phone all the time. I, th like, I think I can do that Earl right Thomas now. Said I had some of the sweetest feet he's ever seen. Hey, him and Justin <laughs> Tucker, in world, NFL DB. All Decade team. Rod, I know you crunched Shout the numbers out. on safeties uh, in the yeah. Hall of Fame. Um, oh, he's all, the Hall of Fame. All Decade team doesn't guarantee you get to the Hall of Fame, but it's usually a part of the resume. Earl Thomas is a Hall of Famer. It's, it's a oh, big yeah. deal. I, when I crunched He's going to be a first ballot That guy. was the point I was trying to make because I want the Cowboys to go get him because he was a Hall of Famer. I want the Texans to go get him. Turns out because his agent um, is Deshaun Watson's agent. Yeah, uh, David. Who, who David Mulligetto who, yeah. who went to Texas. And he, I guess they were trying to get Earl Thomas to the, to the Texans. You, Earl Thomas said Bill O'Brien said he wasn't serious about playing. <laughs> that, no, I'm not making that. That's a real <laughs> story. <laughs> no, I just like, Earl, I was Earl like, Thomas what? said when they were good free agency, it was like at the rodeo or something like that, and, and then he was talking to Bill O'Brien, and Bill O'Brien basically told him, like, no, nah, I don't think you're serious about playing. You know. And that's why he, he wasn't interested in Bill O'Brien's colors Bill seem himself. to be showing very brightly <laughs> with, the, Bill with is power. Good. Yeah, he's he's trying, he's trying I'm, to be Belichick. He's, I'm not a I'm not a Texans fan, but Rod, folks like you who are, I feel sorry for you guys. Oh man, man. yeah, because that's thought, coming I, from a Jerry Jones like well, disciple. I thought I felt bad about Cowboy. I felt bad for Cowboys fans about Jason Garrett for years. Oh, uh, you know, I always thought Bill O'Brien was better than Jason Garrett, but. I guess there's some good and yeah, some well, maybe bad. Maybe as a coach, but then it sounds like as a human, Bill O'Brien's been vacant for a while. He's just his interpersonal skills are terrible. Yeah, you, very you, bad. You uh, mentioned comes the, old, from the, Belichick the Earl Thomas, Earl Thomas Hall of Fame candidacy, real quick. I know it's dicey for kickers because I think there's only three of them in the Hall of Fame, and Seth's got a a shot. Adam Vinatieri is going to be four whenever he decides to retire and becomes yeah. eligible. 
But if Justin Tucker keeps on this trajectory, mm-hmm. he's going to have a really compelling argument. He'll have a shot. He'll, what, the, what was it one Super Bowl? Two one Super Bowl? One, one Super Bowl. Yeah, and trust me, with Lamar, he'll, he'll get to the playoffs and have some more clutch kicks with Lamar Jackson at the helm. So I think he's got a shot. Earl Thomas is already shooing it. Uh, done. Thanks, yeah, man, that's a hey, that's a that's a goat right there, right? Yes. I'm like, you know what? I'm putting him on the Mount Rushmore for that. I forgot about that. He goes on the Mount Rushmore. I gotta kick somebody off. Hey, speaking of that, <laughs> somebody gotta go. I might be nasty, Nate. I love you, Nate, but yeah. Speaking of activities uh, that people can do during downtime, Rod, you gotta. This is this is a perfect time for you to revitalize the DBU rankings. I've already started, actually. Uh, I'm already I'm already a week or so into the new rankings, but it's not it, there's there's a lot of shifting, mm-hmm. but there are not a lot of additions really to the of late. Deshaun Elliott is probably the one that shook up the top twenty the most. Uh, Deshaun Elliott was a unanimous All American. People don't realize how hard it is to be unanimous. That means every publication said that guy's a That's first crazy. team. That's crazy. I didn't even realize that. I That's like do, Jerry I think Gray. Johnny Johnson wasn't even a, 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 a unanimous All American. I think he was consensus. Like Jerry Gray, it's about unanimous. It. That's Jerry crazy. Gray and Huff, were they the only? Two? I think Huff Daddy was. Huff I, was not. He Huff wasn't was not. so he was, only that's Jerry what I'm Gray. Like, look, at, make sure I'm right about that, Deshaun, because I think he was unanimous, and I was like, that can't be right. It's so rare to be unanimous, yeah. dude. Like, well, I mean, is, you have to get it go all, look at all, all. We got to do a list of unanimous, uh, you know, all, all Americans here in Texas. That's rare. I'm trying to find it if the, uh, okay, denotes unanimous all American selections. I count these numbers up. You got Scott Appleton, hmm. Justin Blaylock. Earl Campbell. Yeah. That's three. That's what I'm saying. It's not Jerry, a lot. Jerry Gray. Four. Jerry Gray. I figured he was. Yeah. Michael Huff was, actually. Huff dad. So, so Huff dad and Jerry Gray. So Huff and Blaylock, Jerry, two of them are okay. on the 05 team. Derek Johnson. DJ on the 04. So the 04 team. Johnny Johnson twice. He was twice? Two times unanimous. unanimous Hold on. Wow. I'm sorry, Johnny. I, I I thought it was consensus. My bad. Man. Uh, Bud McFadden. So there's another for the offensive <laughs> That's line. That's crazy. Unanimous twice. Steve McMichael. That's crazy. Bam, bam. Tommy Nobis. <laughs> Brian Arakpo. Wow. Uh, James Saxton. Jonathan Scott. Another on the offensive line. Wow. Okay. Bra- Brad Shearer. There's another defensive lineman. Speaking of D lineman and O lineman, Kenny Sims. Jerry Sizemore, uh, Johnny Treadwell, Still. Ricky Williams twice, mm. and Bill Wyman. So DBs, that's Michael Huff, Jerry Gray, Johnny Johnson. 19 this guys. Is the did u- list I'm looking at isn't updated with Deshaun Elliott, but Deshaun Elliott was one. Was yes, that four, four DBs in the history of DBU? You Huff, yeah. Johnny Johnson, there? Jerry Gray, and Elliott. Deshaun wow. Elliott. That's pretty hey, Johnny pretty Johnson good. was twice? Man, that's Maybe. impressive. Man, that's impressive. See, I apologize, John. I'm sorry. That's why you're on the Mount Rushmore. I put you on the Mount Rushmore for, for real. That's... You asked if we have anything else. Uh, when I Googled that dude, Man, Quinn that Ewers, Where's that, that quarterback. So I just pulled it off of Wikipedia. Okay. He looks like he's from the Koba Kai Dojo. The <laughs> Quinn Ewers, if y'all haven't seen the fan, if you're a crazy kid <laughs> fan, he definitely looks like Johnny. He does, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk about Quinn Ewers' hair and DBU rankings and all kinds of other stuff next week on the show. Uh, Matt, thanks for everything, man. You're on. Uh, thank you. And Midwater. <laughs> take a drink of water. Mm-hmm. Rod, be appreciate the time and the knowledge, man. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in a podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn. 104.9, 1019, AM 1260. Streaming on the Horn app and at hornfm.com. You can also ask your smart speaker, say, Alexa, play 104.9 the Horn, and she will play it for you. I know. I've done it myself. Uh, you can catch me and Craig Way on Light the Tower every weekday from 10 to noon. And Rod B. on the Triple Option Afternoon Show with RBKD with Rod, Brad Kellner, and Kevin Dunn. Shame this plug. And thanks to Matt. As he mentioned earlier, you can get all of our classic interviews archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. Also, don't forget to search Horns 24-7 Podcasts anywhere you get your podcasts. Out, Google Podcasts is now available on iOS operating systems, so... Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, however you get your podcast, search Horns 24-7 Podcasts. You get us, State of Recruiting, and the flagship anywhere you get your podcast. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.